Good morning, United City Church. How y'all doing? Hey, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is where we're going to be this morning. If you don't know me, my name is Patrick. I'm the youth pastor here at United City Church. And let me just add my word to Pastor Chris. Man, we're really glad you're here this morning. Whether you're watching online for the first time or, or whether you're in the room for the very first time. And we just want to say that we're really honored that you would choose to spend your time here because time is valuable. And we only all, uh, all have 24 hours. So the fact that you would choose to be here this morning means a big deal to us. Um, but I also want to give a special welcome and a special word of greeting to all of the men who are watching um, at the Ramsey unit and to all of the women who will be watching at the Plain State Correctional Facility. Man, we love you. Uh, we're encouraged by your faith. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. As Pastor Chris said um, this morning, we are starting a, a new series. Actually, we'll be in several series uh, over the next couple months, just going through uh, the letter uh, from Paul to the church in Rome. And um, it, it's going to be incredible. So if you're looking for a reading plan, like maybe you're like, hey, I want to engage with my Bible more, and, and I've been kind of struggling in that, let me encourage you to read along with Romans for us. Maybe you're really good and you're crushing a Bible reading plan. Let me also encourage, I mean, jump in and uh, engage with the heartbeat of where God is taking us right now and uh, jump in Romans. It's going to be incredible. Um, uh, speaking of incredible... Uh, I've had the best weekend I think I've had in like forever. Yesterday, uh, Saturday, uh, I got the insane privilege to join with some serve team members from United City Church and uh, go into the Plain State Correctional Facility um, and be a part of a baptism service where we saw 75 women in that facility be baptized and proclaim. <laughs> yeah. And to proclaim that Jesus has changed their life. And, man, it was just incredible. I mean, it was powerful. It was, it was unlike, honestly, if I could just be honest and not be the pastor and, and you know, hyperbole. It, it was one of the craziest things I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I, I've done a lot of baptisms, 10 years in the ministry, and uh, maybe, I don't know, close to 1,000. I don't know. And this was the greatest baptism service I've ever been a part of. Um, I'm crying. I took Dalton, our middle school pastor. He's crying. We're trying to look cool. You can't look cool crying, you know. Um, and, and these women, it's just, it was just incredible to watch them worship and sing while they're waiting to be released row by row and to get in the water and to watch them come up out of that water just changed. You know, just change, just physically, you could see it on their face. And uh, Jeff and I were even saying like, hey, there's no doubt that she really believes this, right? Because they just came out with such, just such clarity of hope and joy. And, and so here's what I want to do. I, I say all that to say this. Uh, this morning, I want to pray that we would encounter God like that. Because I didn't know this weekend that I had to go into prison to find freedom. But this weekend... I walked away and my faith was just full and, and I was blown away. It was unlike anything I've ever experienced. And, and I, literally, I literally drove away and I was talking to Dalton. I said, man, I, I think I'm just praying that for tomorrow that United City Church would encounter God the way that these women have today. And so if that's okay with you, can I pray for that, that God would move this morning? It's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same Bible. It's the same God that impacted and changed those women that wants to meet with us here this morning today as we jump into Romans chapter 1. So I'm going to pray for you. I want you to pray for me. And I, let's just pray for each other that God would come and speak and move in power because I want more of that. Um, and it, it's just incredible. So let, let me pray or else I'll just talk about that all day. So God, I'm thankful uh, for the gospel. I'm thankful that you meet us right where we are at the point of our greatest need, God, but that you don't leave us in our mess. Uh, God, that you've given us a message of hope and reconciliation back to you through Jesus. And God, I just pray for this church, that we would encounter you the same way your church in Plain State is encountering you. And God, we would experience that same uh, type of overflow in our lives where we too would say, yes, Jesus has changed everything about me. Now come and see what he's done in me, because he, he might be able to do it in you too. It's in your name that we pray and, and ask that even before we see it, Jesus. Amen. Have you ever been ashamed of yourself? No, just me, I'm the only human being in the room. You ever been ashamed of yourself? Yeah. 
I mean, I've been ashamed of myself before. You've been ashamed of yourself before, whether you want to admit it or not. Man, being ashamed is just where you feel guilty or embarrassed as a result of some actions that you've taken. And so, yeah, I've definitely, I've definitely been embarrassed before. I've been ashamed. Like when you're uh, trying to go through a push door, but you're pulling it. <laughs> you ever been there? And it's like, you know, the thing about being ashamed of yourself is like, you, you got to try and play it off, you know? It's like, you're like, and then somebody just walks next to you and you're like, hey, idiot. You just, you know. And you're like, oh, no, I knew that. I was testing the hinges. Like it was, you know, I'm just trying to, just trying to figure it out. I've been ashamed of myself before. You, you, ever, um, <clears throat> you ever lost your car in the Walmart parking lot? Like you forgot where you parked? Uh, have you ever called the police and reported your Jeep Grand Cherokee stolen because you parked it in the Walmart parking lot and you forgot where it was? <laughs> you talked to the detective and like, no, it was right here and now it's gone. You have your fiance be like, did you check the whole parking lot? She's on the phone. Did you check everywhere? Kylie, I think I know where I parked the car. Are you sure? Yes, I park it in the same place every time. And two days later, you come down off your arrogance and your pride and you check the parking lot and you got to call the detective back and be like, hey, Bill, so the thing is, I found the car, and it's uh, at Walmart, you know? You got to walk that back. It's tough. Yeah, I'm embarrassed, feel guilty, trying to cover it up. I've been on this journey since, like, June. I've been on, like, this fitness journey. And uh, I've lost 28 pounds, which is cool. But I was, uh, no, you don't have to applaud for that. That's dope. But the other day, a friend DM'd me that I used to work with at another church staff. I hope you're watching. And um, he said, hey, dude, I've been looking through your Instagram. It's incredible. It's, you've lost like a ton of weight. And I was like, yeah, dude, I'm eating like a bag of cashews and like a Laura bar every day. And it's terrible, but like it's not sustainable, you know. It's, but it's great. Yeah, I've lost 28 pounds. And then he goes, yeah, man, it's just a shame that United City will never experience fat pat. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't cry, you know. <laughs> I wanted to, but I didn't. I did, though, jump on my Instagram, and I started archiving all my fat photos, you know? Like, I didn't want to delete them because the memory's there. But, like, I was just, you know, archiving them. as like, oh, that one needs to go, and that one needs to go. And I'd hide all the evidence that I used to be 28 pounds heavier, and I was like, look, double chin there. You look a little fluffy there. And, and so I'm trying to cover it all up. And, man, isn't that what shame does? I mean, honestly, when you're ashamed, isn't the effect of being ashamed trying to cover up the evidence, trying to cover up the very thing that you're ashamed of. So I guess the question I would ask this morning, the tension we have to wrestle with is this, are you ashamed of Jesus? Are you ashamed of Jesus? Or let me say it this way, so that way we can actually have a filter for it, not just religiously sidestep it. Are you actively trying to cover up the work of God in your life? Are you trying to camouflage the movement of Jesus in your life so that way no one else can see it. See, I think the truth is we are ashamed of Jesus because we look back here and we're embarrassed of who we were before Jesus. And so we try and cover it up. But at the same time, post-Jesus, we're still embarrassed about some of this. And we try and cover it up too. And the tension is, is we get caught in the in-between where we're either covering up who I was or who I am. You with me? We're in the tension of covering up who I was or who I am. And so we're living these duplicitous lives. You know, where when, when I'm at church, I, I'm trying to cover up the language that I use when I'm outside of church. When I'm in life group, I'm trying to clean up my behavior because I don't normally act like this around not church people. You understand what I'm saying? I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to hide my browser history. I, I'm trying to hide my addiction. I'm trying to hide my apathy at home to the things of faith, and I don't really lead my wife or I'm not really sharing Jesus with my kids. I'm not praying with anybody. And, and so I'm trying to hide that all um, in church and act like I've got it together. But when I'm in the world and I'm in the workplace or I'm at school or I'm around my friends, I'm actually also trying to hide the fact that I believe the Bible speaks because it speaks to some scary things in culture right now. So I'm trying, to hi- I'm trying to hide where I stand on gender identity. I'm trying to hide where I stand on biblical marriage. I'm trying to hide ab- about the fact that I'm actually trying to follow Jesus and look like him. I'm trying to hide the fact that I believe the Bible speaks and has authority and can actually lead and guide me in my life. And so, yes, of course, I think the tension is we're ashamed. I think the harder tension is, like Tim Keller says, is we're actively trying to hide our past and our present. And so 
What does it mean to be ashamed of the gospel? What it means to be ashamed of the gospel and to be ashamed of Jesus is when we try to hide it. When we try to cover up its effect. When we try to cover up its work in our lives. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to jump into Romans chapter 1. And I want to look at the life of this man named Paul. And I want to look at his opening to the letter that he writes to the believers in Rome. And I want to begin to uncover this ugly truth of being ashamed of Jesus. Romans chapter 1, if you have it, is where we're going to start. Before we jump in really quick, let me just say this. If you've never heard of the Apostle Paul, if you've never heard of uh, Paul in your Bible, what you need to know is this, is that Paul may be the greatest Christian to ever live, right? Like outside of Jesus, don't, don't Jesus jig me here. Like he may be the greatest Christian, honestly, to ever live. You think about Paul and some of the things that he's done. He's the most successful church planner the world has ever seen. I mean, my guy basically starts the entire Gentile church, like right, right after, uh, you know, his conversion. He's this crazy, awesome guy. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, right? Two-thirds of your New Testament is all Paul, uh, letters to churches that he planted. And in those letters, we actually find the majority of the New Testament instruction on how to be a Jesus follower and how to do church. And so Paul was like this crazy, strong, super Jesus Christian guy. And actually, he would describe himself that same way. Now look at Romans chapter 1 in the beginning, how Paul decides to introduce himself to the believers in Rome. He says this, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. Like, yeah, I know my calling. <laughs> called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. But hold up, we've got to stop right there really quick. We've got to stop right there before we go any further because there's kind of an asterisk next to Paul's name. There's kind of a little bit of an asterisk next to everything I've told you about Paul. There's actually kind of a, an asterisk uh, next to everything that Paul has just told you about himself. See, Paul was probably born like a decade after Jesus, and he grew up Jewish in a wealthy family. Um, Paul later would purchase a Roman citizenship, and it just shows the affluence and the wealth his family had. Actually, he was probably so wealthy and, and so affluent um, that he was able to uh, secure some of the best religious instruction as a Jew under some of the greatest theological training of the day. And all of that led Paul to uh, hate Jesus. All of that led Paul to actually hate the movement of Jesus and the little Christs, the Christians that were running around trying to propitiate the way of Jesus to other people. And so Paul actually spends um, most of his life, in the beginning right here where we get into his story, uh, he's all focused on stomping out the Christian church. I mean, he, he is dead set on capturing, persecuting, imprisoning, and killing Christians. Matter of fact, the first time we meet Paul in Scripture is he is aiding and abetting in the murder of a Christian. And that's where we get to meet him. Um, but something happens to Paul. Um, on the way to Damascus, where he was going to imprison more Christians and kill more Christians and persecute more Christians, he meets Jesus. And Jesus appears to him in a bright light, in a shining light, in a blinding light. And basically Jesus says, hey, dude, what, what are you on right now? <laughs> like, what are you doing? And Paul's like, who are you? And he's like, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Stop, you know. And, and he's like, oh, this changed my life. And then all of a sudden you get this guy who uh, was going by his Jewish name, Saul. And he decides to change uh, and go by his Greek name, Paul, because everything about him is changing. And he becomes this really big Jesus guy. So much to the so that he identifies as a servant of Christ instead of a persecutor of Christ. You with me? So much so that he realized that he's been called to be an apostle instead of a person who's trying to persecute and tear down the church. So much so that he says, I'm set apart for the gospel. Which in your Bible actually just means good news. He said, I'm set apart for the good news about Jesus because Jesus was good news to me. And so I want to take the good news of Jesus to everyone. And look at how Paul in Romans chapter 1 describes that good news of Jesus. He says this. Set apart for the gospel, which he, God, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, underline this in your Bible, highlight this on the digital app, through whom we have received grace. And that's my story, man. Jesus has given me grace. He's not held things against me. An apostleship to bring the obedience of faith. It's like, I'm, not, I'm trying to bring obedience now. Instead of trying to destroy the church, I'm trying to make people obedient to the head of the church, which is Jesus. For the sake of his name among all the nations, including you. 
who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this description because Paul is is not just saying, hey, I'm an apostle set apart for the gospel. He's saying this, look at me, he's saying, you need to understand the message uh, that's changed me. You need to understand the message that changed everything about who I am and made me someone new and the message that I've been set apart for. And it's this, first, you need to know God keeps his promise. Like God has kept his promise, what he promised to do before you even born in the foundations of the world when he spoke through the prophets, a descendant from David to be the Messiah, God did that. And he did it through Jesus. And don't get it twisted that Jesus emptied himself of divinity, stepped out of heaven, became the fullness of God, pleased to dwell in a human being, lived a life you could never, you could never live. He always submitted to God's design instead of his own desires. And in doing that, he perfectly fulfilled the law. And then he died in your place on a cross. He was a substitute for your atonement and right standing with God. And after he was, so after God saw fit to, to slay Jesus on the cross for your sins, he actually saw fit to raise him in power over sin and death. So Jesus now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has the ability to give you victory over sin and death. And that's what he's done in me. And Paul says, it's that story that changed my story. It's that story that I want to make sure, Romans, you get right out of the gate that has changed every single thing about me. And I want to make sure that, that, that message of grace and forgiveness and hope that leads to obedience under Jesus instead of rebellion from him goes to all of the world. And for you to specifically know, that can be your story too. Asterisk, still there. Because for Paul, there was still a significant issue. And you can see that issue in Acts chapter 9, verse 20 and 21 and 23, right after his conversion, right after his Jesus moment. Like like a good Jewish person, he goes to the synagogue, he goes to the church, and he starts proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah. Listen to what happens. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he's the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Isn't this the dude who's been persecuting us? (laughs) Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem for all who would call upon his name? And has he not come here to Damascus for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priest? They're saying, hey, listen, uh, are we sure that this isn't just a trick of this guy? That he's not now just adopted a new strategy to come in and be like, yeah, I'm pro-Jesus. You pro-Jesus? Boom, gotcha, (laughs) you know? And like now I'm going to imprison you and take you back and you're going to go to prison and die? They're like, we can't trust this guy. And after several days, it actually says this in verse 23, and after many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. You think you've experienced church hurt, (laughs) and maybe you have, but no one's tried to kill you. (laughs) Paul was like not team Jesus, now he's team Jesus, and he's trying to join the team, and they're like, let's kill him. And so Paul was in this tension. Oh, he's in the tension that you and I are in. Do I cover up who I was and just forget about what God saved me from? Or, 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 do I cover up the work of God in my life and seek to just kind of make a living and hide the fact that God has done something radical in my life. See, Paul had two options. He could, he could keep proclaiming Jesus, he could keep being bold, he could keep sharing about the gospel, or he could shut up. And he could be silenced by the crowds. And this reality, this tension, actually is the bigger context for Romans chapter 1, 16 that we're about to get into. That means so much more from Paul to the church in Rome than if you just read it and threw it on a coffee mug. It's this reality, it's this tension that Paul is actually living in his real life, flesh and blood life that he lived thousands and thousands of years ago, that he wrote this phrase, for, for, I am not ashamed of the gospel. No, I know who I was, and I know the message that changed me, and I'm not offended by it. And I'm not afraid of it. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to save anyone who would believe first to the Jew and also to the Greek. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying this. Hey, look at me. He's saying this. I'm not covering up the work of God in my life. 
I'm not going to work really hard to camouflage the movement of Christ in my life so that way I can just blend in and not face persecution and not have to kind of give answers for my behavior back then and my behavior now, to not have to give an account of my encounter with Jesus. Why? Why, why, why? Why does Paul say that? Because for Paul, the gospel is power. It's not, a, it's not a thing of shame. It's actually a thing of empowerment. And so he says, hey, don't, don't you know who I was? Don't you know that I was using my life to tear down the church? Okay, now do you know who I am now? I'm Paul, an apostle of Jesus set aside for the gospel to build his church to the ends of the earth, not just for the Jew, but for the Gentile also. And don't you see the space between? And for Paul, the space between had nothing to do with him and had everything to do with God. Do you understand? For Paul, it was like, of course there's a gap between who I was and then who Jesus changed me, made to be, me, me to be, and who I am now. Of course there's a gap. But that doesn't say anything about me. That doesn't say I'm fake. That doesn't say that I'm trying to be this person I'm not. No, that actually has everything to say about the power of God on display. And so how could I be ashamed of that? How could I try to camouflage that in my life? How could I try and cover up who I was and how God met me and saved me and changed me and who he has made me to be now? Because if God can take me, Saul, the persecutor of the church, and meet me and change me and give me grace and power and make me somebody who's building the church, what can he do in you, Rome? Like, that's the power. The power, Paul is saying, is if he can do it in me, catch a vision for your own self. What can he do through you? I'm not offended by me. You for sure don't be offended by me. Just catch a vision for what God may want to do through you. And so actually, really, this morning, United City Church, if you only write one thing down, if you only remember one thing from Romans chapter 1, the ugly truth needs to be this. God doesn't want to hide your past. He wants to highlight your past. God does not want to hide your past. He wants to highlight your past because it's in the space between who you were and who you are where his power is on display. It's in the space between what you used to be and what he's made you into now that he gets the glory. You understand? Yeah. And see, that's, that's why the lie of sin and shame is and the enemy who, who John 10, 10 says comes to steal, kill, and destroy everything about your life. That's why the lie is you need to cover up. That's why the lie is you need to be ashamed. Because Satan would love nothing more for you to cover up the move of God. You understand? Right. Because if I'm ashamed that I used to do this and I used to watch this and I used to talk like this and I used to hang out like this and I knew that I was in these snaps or whatever... And so I can't put on display who God made me down here, then what I'm actually covering up in shame is the power of God. Right. And so, of course, the enemy wants you to hide. Of course, he wants you to cover it up. Of course, he wants you to be ashamed. It's actually been his plan for humanity from the very beginning. I mean, go back in your mind to the, to the good Bible knowledge that maybe you grew up with, or maybe you're hearing this for the first time and it's starting to click. Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve, they're living in the garden. They're in perfect relationship with God. God says, you can eat all these trees, just not that one. And they're like, that one looks pretty good. We're going to eat of it, right? Like, oh, thousands, but not this one? Okay, we're going to do that one, you know? And they eat of the tree, and sin comes into their life. And look at what Genesis 3 says. It says this, then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day, and the man and his wife hid themselves. Do you hear that? I, I don't know if he did. Because in a perfect reality, before sin has kicked them out of the garden, you have humanity seeking to remove themselves from the presence of God because of their shame. I don't have time to preach the sermon on the difference between like actually sewing a loincloth for themselves and hiding their physical shame and then removing themselves, trying to spiritually distance themselves from God and hiding in the cool of the day. But the effect of sin and the, and the strategy of the enemy is that you would be ashamed of Jesus, that you would be ashamed of the work of God in your life because of your past. So that's the lie. But the truth is, is that the power of the gospel 
is in the past. The, the power of the gospel is in the fact that the guy who used to persecute the church is now building it. You understand? You get that? You see it? Yeah. Like the power of Paul's ministry isn't all that he was accomplishing. It's who he used to be. It's that God was working in spite of him. It's not like he went to church planning classes. It's not like he learned how to take the gospel all over the place. It's not like he went to preaching seminars. He was killing Christians. And that's the guy that God was like, yeah, I'll take that guy and I'll use him to build the church because then people will see my power all over his life. So United City Church, man, when you get tempted to hide the move of God in your life, man, fight that. Because that's the plan of the enemy for your life. That's not the plan of God over your life. Because listen what Paul says. Paul is about to unpack something that's deeply (laughs) theological and sometimes hard to understand. But Paul's about to give an, an explanation for why he cannot be ashamed and why he can understand the power of the gospel to be so in the past of what he was saved from and who God had created him to be. He says this at the end of uh, Romans 1. He says this. For in it, the gospel of God, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Let me read that again. For in it, the righteousness of God The glory of God, the majesty of God, the power of God, the the rightness of God is revealed in the gospel. And it's from faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by, by faith. Paul says, hey, the righteousness of God, the power of God, it's actually revealed from your faith. So as you're not covering up and as you're letting the gospel be seen in your life, as you're pointing to the space between, be like, yep, that is the difference between who I was before Jesus, how I met Jesus, and who I am now. Paul's saying, hey, that's where the power is seen. That's where the righteousness of God comes in display. So your faith in Jesus, despite your past identity, puts God's righteousness and power on display in your life. And the effect of that faith is that it spurs faith on in someone else. Another version says this, one translation says this, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith. Both springing from faith and leading to faith, which means this, when you let people see the gospel on display in your life, when you display your faith and you stop covering up uh, the work of God in your life in shame and embarrassment, it puts the power of God on display and creates faith in someone else. So let me ask this, is your faith for you or is it for faith? That's a tough one. Is your faith for you or is it for faith? Because we are really good about faith being for me. Hey, that's my relationship with Jesus, okay? That's a private thing. Hey, uh, faith for me is locked inside of this routine. If I go to church on Sunday, I even give. Don't press me here. Like that's, that's, a, that's a me and Jesus thing. Like, I'm not going to put it on display at work. I'm not going to do all this. Like, faith faith is for me. The problem with that is that Paul is saying that when I let God's righteousness be on display in my life, it actually lets other people see of what God can might do in theirs. It's like, man, he can call that dude into ministry and use him like that. With a past like that, what might he be able to do in me? Do you understand? And so when I'm living with my faith on display, the righteousness of God, the power of God is springing from my faith to create faith in other people. That's what Paul's saying. And when we get ashamed and when we cover up the reconciliation piece, we lose all the power. We lose the best gospel sharing tool that we have. And we 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 try to knowledge people into Jesus. Why are we not standing there being like, hey, this is just who I was before Christ. Here's how I encountered him. And here's who I am now. Because in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. It's on display. And do you know why the the baptisms at Plain State were so powerful? Do you know why I told that story in the beginning? It's not to share a ministry win. It's not even to hype up the ministry efforts there Talk about oaks of righteousness or all the amazing things. I want to talk about the women at Plain State because when I was there baptizing them, 
and I was grabbing their arms and I was seeing the cut marks. And as I was bringing them up out of the water and I could see the scars across their throat where many of them had tried to kill themselves. And when I see the prison tattoos all over them and I can see, it's like reading a map of history of pain and hurt and brokenness. Do you know what that made me see? It made me see the righteousness of God on display. Because what those women understood in baptism in a prison was the space between who they were and their life story up to that point was made much because of what Jesus had done in them. And if they can do it in a prison, why do we struggle to do it with our freedom? I'm standing there watching these women sing and worship the Maverick City through a little, like, boom box that I had in my room in seventh grade. And I'm watching them weep and cry. And I'm watching them come out of the water with their countenance visibly different. And I'm watching them hug each other and lay hands on each other and pray for each other. And I'm listening to the stories of volunteers being like, I've been praying for that girl for so long. Here's her story. It's so crazy. You have no idea what's going on with this. And now actually she's serving and she led that girl to Christ. So can she help with the baptism? All these amazing things. It's the power of God on display. For them to say, it doesn't matter that I'm incarcerated. It doesn't matter for the reasons that I was in here. And my past doesn't make me so ashamed that I can't go public in my faith through baptism to let people see that Jesus changed me. And then you know what I got to watch that was the most powerful part? Adult and I stood there as these women sopping wet who were baptized in their just inmate outfit, whatever. Sopping wet, barefoot, walk back to their prison cells. I'm watching a line of 75 women walk back into prison from the chapel. And I started to think, man, I wonder what they're going to encounter when they get back in there. I wonder what all their cellmates are going to start saying. And God just invaded my heart with this burden that, man, they were about to go through her? You? I know what you're in here for. You, I know what you were, I, were, were we just, weren't you just, don't you? And I knew that God put me in playing state on a random Saturday that I said yes to, not even thinking about it, because he knew the message that he wanted you to hear. That the power of God is on display when we wear the gospel in spite of our past. That those women were about to have a moment like Paul where they could say, I know who I was, but I got to tell you about who I am now because of this encounter with Jesus. It was Romans 1 right in front of me in flesh and blood lived out. And it changed me. You know what their faith did? You want to know? The springboard of their faith created faith in me. I'm standing there crying. Dalton's standing there trying to like, <laughs> you look away. Because I've not seen faith like that. And I left that prison going, God, if you can do it in plain state, if you can do it in these women's lives, if they can find that hope, if they can find that healing, if they can, if they can feel the boldness to say, even though I'm in prison, I'm going to do a chapel baptism service. I'm going to let everybody know that Jesus has changed my life. God, what could you do in me? What could you do in a 29-year-old pastor at United City Church? What could he do in you? If God can do that in them, what might he do in you? So I guess the real question is actually this. Are you ready to live by faith? Are you ready to live in such a way that you're done hiding and you're done covering up? You're done with the duplicitous lifestyle of I'm this way at church and I'm this way in the world and I'm trying to hide both parts of who I am and so I feel like I'm lost and I have no identity and I have no purpose. And are you ready to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the power and presentation of the righteousness of God? Are you ready to live in such a way that people look at your life and start to think, man, what might God be able to do in me too? What if we became a church where every one of us, every single day, lived with that type of faith? And that type of faith is actually what led us to cross divides. What would happen, dads, if you caught a vision for your life 
about letting faith be loud in your home and in your living room and your dinner table that led to the salvation of your children? What would it look like for you to step up and not be ashamed of the ways that you've not led in the past, but to grab your spouse by the hand and say, hey, we're doing this now? Moms, what would it look like to embrace a life of faith of not being ashamed of the gospel so much that you're planting so many seeds in the life of your kids and the other moms that you're in interaction with and your social media and your outside life and your jobs and your careers and your workplace that people start getting saved because of the work of God in you? What would it look like Professionals, young professionals, old, older professionals, retire. What would it look like if the gospel was so on display that we're not just baptizing people from a football team, but we're baptizing people from your cubicle? Because they saw the gospel on display in your life. What would it look like for some of you to embrace baptism as that public outward display of the inward change of the gospel in your life. To say, yeah, my old life really is under that water and the new me who's up is not going to be perfect. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to screw it up more times than I get it right. But I've been changed by the power of Jesus. Let's think about what he could do in you too. Youth, students, what would it look like if you stopped trying to fight to be two different people? You're so well known, maybe in our youth ministry or another church or whatever, whatever your scenario is. You're so well known for faith there, but in the halls of your school, you are hidden. And what would it look like not to be afraid of your mistakes and your mess ups, but instead to embrace them as the power of God on display in your life? What would happen? United City Church, what would happen if this place became a place where we could truly, not religiously, but truly say, I am not ashamed of the gospel in my life because it is the power of salvation of God on display. And if he can do it in me, then he can do it in you. So let's talk about my story. Can you answer that question? And that's a personal question. And it's an impersonal room. And the only way I know how to have that conversation or the best way I know how to have that conversation is like this. I want you to just close your eyes. You don't have to pack up to close your eyes. You don't need to put your stuff away to close your eyes. You just need to sit right where you are and close your eyes. You don't need to leave and try and get out early. Just, just close your eyes. Because in this big impersonal room with your eyes closed, it is just my voice in your head. And right now an impersonal room is very personal. The question I have for you in the room this morning is this. Are you ready to live by faith? I think there's three different people in the room specifically, and I'm going to call out each one of you and challenge you. The first group of people is, man, you're a follower of Jesus. And maybe you're a career Christian. (laughs) All you know is, like, loving Jesus. You're the person that when we have coffee, you say, man, I've just been loving Jesus since I was six. But the truth is... And in love, the truth is, your life of faith is not sparking faith in others. We say at United City Church all the time, who's your one? It's the idea that you would have someone in your mind who your faith life, your relationship with Jesus, your encounter with God, you are praying and hoping and intentionally sharing, not just with your actions and hoping that they catch something, but with your words. You are sharing the gospel with somebody. And for the first group of you in the room this morning, I would say this. What it looks like to live by faith is to intentionally and boldly share your story with someone who does not know Jesus. To say, hey, this is who I was before Jesus. This is my Paul encounter. This is how Jesus encountered me and saved me. And now this is who I am because of Jesus. And for you in the room, the reality is this. You've never shared that story, and you know you should. If that's you, I want you to just look at me right, right quick follower of Jesus in the room. You've never shared your story of salvation with someone specifically in the hopes that it would lead to their salvation. Just look up at me. Yeah, I see you all over the room. Here's a second group of people. Second group of people is, man, you're a follower of Jesus, but you've never been baptized. And the truth is, is that baptism is one of the greatest ways to let the gospel be seen on your life and not be ashamed of it. 
Because just like those women in Plain State, just like the five people today at United City, you get to say and bring people around you say, hey, look, my old life is over. That's who I was underneath the water. That addict is who I was underneath the water. That adulterous spouse is who I was underneath the water. That addicted person is who I was underneath the water. All of that shame and mistakes and all the mess of my life, that's who I was. And now coming out of the water, I have been raised to walk in newness with Christ. And the truth is this morning, you need to let the gospel be seen in your life by going public with your faith in baptism. And you've never done that. If that's you, would you just look up at me real quick? Yeah, I see you. I see you. I see you all over the room. Here's the last group. And if you're looking at me, stay looking at me. Here's the last group. The truth is this. The truth for you is to let the power of the gospel be on display in your life is that you need to receive it for the first time. That you've never had an encounter with Jesus where he's changed everything about you. There's never been a moment where you've seen Jesus for who he is and understood that he was God's son come to live in your place and die in your place and be raised in newness of life to offer you that same power over sin and death. And there's never been a moment where the gospel and the good news of Jesus has been received by you in faith and been power in your life for change. But this morning... With your heart pounding right now and it's being super sweaty, you know that your next step is, man, I need to receive the power of the gospel in my life. I need to give my life to Jesus. For the first time, if that's you, just look up at me. Pat, I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to receive the power of the gospel of Christ in my life right now this morning. There are people looking at me all over the room. So here's what I want to say. And I challenge you. I challenge you. Here in a second, I'm going to pray. When I pray, we're going to stand and sing. But right now, if you're looking at me, would you be bold and just come now? Come grab one of these pastors. Come grab one of these teammates, one of these ministers on staff and say, hey, I need to receive the power of the gospel in one of these three ways. I need to share it with the people I know. I need to step out and be baptized. Or I need to receive Christ in fullness of faith. Right now, I'm going to pray. And when I'm done praying, man, all three of those people looked at me. This room was full of heads up people. So don't miss your moment and waste your Sunday. Don't let this be a service on Memorial Day, but let it be a road to Damascus encounter with Christ. I'm going to pray. And when I'm done praying, you stand and you come and you grab one of these pastors and ministers on staff and say, hey, I need to talk to you about Jesus. And Jesus, we love you. And we believe that, God, the power of the gospel is best on display in the space between who we used to be and who we are now. And so, Jesus, we are bold in that faith. We proclaim that faith right now in this moment. God, would you give all the people who just looked at me a clarity and a courage to stand up and move for you instead of covering up the work of you in their life? God, would you come now and move in power in only a way that you can? And Jesus, is in your name, we pray it and believe it before we even see it. Amen. Man, if you want to stay connected to the life of United City Church, go ahead and text the word GUIDE to the number at the bottom of the screen. It's going to give you all the updates and tell you about what's happening in the regular rhythms of the life of this house. Also, for some of you, maybe you heard today's message and you know that you have a next step, that there is something that God is calling you to do or be a part of. Go ahead and text the number at the bottom of the screen. We want to help you take your next step and plug you into what God may have next for you in your life. Listen, maybe for some of you, it's that you know that you need to take a spiritual step of salvation. Like today's the day that you need to surrender your life to Christ fully and authentically the best way that you know how. We want to hear about that. Go ahead and text that number and let one of our pastors reach out to you and help guide you in a conversation of how you can take your next step of faith in Jesus. Ultimately, man, we love that you join online, but we would love to see you in person. The best way to get connected in person is to go through Growth Track. Growth Track happens every Sunday on campus at 10 a.m. We would love to see you there. Finally, Man, make sure that you like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Hit the subscribe button on the channel so that way you get an alert every time we drop a new video. And we can't wait to see you very soon.